Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here, to be here with so many friends and to uh, discuss an issue which may think, may look as being uh, marginal, but it is uh, absolutely fundamental. Today, we enter into a period of a world where things seem simultaneously gloomy because of the economic situation and politically positive because we see a very large evolution worldwide in the direction of democracy. And it has been clearly said very often that uh, now we can say that history is ending not because history is stable, but because we can forecast that the whole evolution of the world will be to go country after country like a reverse domino uh, fall to uh, the generalization of democracy. And in a certain sense, it's not far from being true. We see uh, after Europe, democracy uh, reaching uh, uh, Latin America, some countries in Africa, Eastern Europe. Uh, and now we see uh, through uh, different events, Libya, Tunisia, Egypt, the, also the birth of democratic movement in uh, the Middle East. And therefore people say, just a matter of time, democracy will be everywhere. There is also a good reason to think about it and to feel that it is true that uh, because there is a link between uh, democracy and market economy. Actually, we may say that also there is a huge trend in the world of the generalization of market economy where the market is uh, everywhere, almost everywhere, except maybe North Korea or some other countries we can name, uh, and that the market economy is also a strong uh, element pushing towards the creation of democracy because you cannot have a market economy with a dictatorship, it doesn't work. Market economy needs uh, transparency, the right to make innovation, the right to move, uh, people as well as capital, and then market is pushing in favor of democracy, while reciprocally, also democracy is pushing towards market, because if you have a democracy, you cannot have a global state-owned economy, because on the long run, democracy will lead to a decision to uh, privatize. And actually, we have seen that in the last years. We have seen market economy uh, getting rid of dictators, that was the case, for instance, 30 years ago in Spain. And we have seen a democracy getting rid of a central plan economy. That was the case in Soviet Union, where we had a beginning of democracy with the attempt to keep a central plan economy that didn't work. And therefore, people may say, well, no question, no reason to discuss market and democracy will uh, help them reciprocally to, to grow. We may also say that uh, there are uh, lessons in history back uh, even before when we see that was, uh, uh, that was written in the 18th century and 19th century about the birth of democracy where people realized, and it was written by many authors of the 19th century, that there is a kind of law, a strong government needs to create uh, growth by creating growth, he needs to create a market economy. By creating a market economy, create a middle class. And the middle class wants property rights. And the property rights uh, cannot be uh, uh, sustainable with, uh, with a government which is arbitrary. Uh, they need a rule of law. And the middle class needs a, a rule of law and therefore push in favor of democracy. But that's exactly, exactly what happened in UK in the uh, 17th century, Netherlands just before, and in other countries uh, later on. Strong government, middle class, democracy. We may say that the, this, this conversation is over, uh, things are going very well, and that, that's it. Of course, it is far from being the case. First, um, what is democracy? Is democracy only a question of uh, uh, free elections? Of course not. Uh, we must define what is democracy. Democracy is not only uh, the fact that from time to time you have elections. Uh, it's a much more deep uh, understanding. It is about uh, transparency. It's about a free press, independent judiciary system, 
uh, intermediaries, uh, trade unions, uh, uh, right of association, uh, right of NGOs, right of civil rights and individuals to, uh, to manifest and to express themselves. And that, of course, is far from uh, being so easy to put in place than elections. Even, we may say also that, uh, if we take history example, we have democracy at a certain moment in time, but democracy is not irreversible. Uh, democracy can begin, begin and then disappear. You can see that was the case in the UK, where they moved towards a little bit more flexible regime, and then we had Cromwell, we can see that with France, and in France, we had the beginning of enlightenment and revolutions, and then three years after, we had the terror, and then we may say, and it's important for the rest of our discussion, that between the beginning of the French Revolution and the full democracy, uh, uh, it takes a lot of time. What means a full democracy, at least we may say full democracy, means at least that the women vote, which is the minimum. And it took uh, one century and a half between the beginning of the French Revolution and that. And I would say myself that if you add as a dimension of democracy uh, the end of death penalty, the US is not yet a, a, a full democracy. Then I would say that uh, it's a very long process with a lot of possible, possible uh, uh, turning. If we look only at what is happening today around the world, you have a lot of different situations. You have Eastern Europe, which has moved and is moving amazingly uh, fast in direction of democracy. We even forgot that 20 years ago, Hungary, Poland, Czech, uh, Czechoslovakia, and others were pure dictatorship, and they are now democracy, parliament, parties, trade unions, free press, etc., etc. It's an amazing success story. You have a fledging democracy or serious attempt to build democracy in Latin America, uh, Brazil, uh, Argentina, Peru, Bolivia, etc., which are almost full-fledged democracy, but with some loopholes, to say the least. You have uh, uh, Africa, where you have some democracy, but also a lot of countries moving in the direction of democracy some real democracy such as Ghana or Senegal, or, but some not in the same direction. And of course, Ivory Coast, the president is the host of his country and this conference is an example of country moving to democracy after a lot of difficulties. And we may say that Africa is mo moving in the good direction as well as I believe myself, China is moving in the direction of democracy, uh, not as we understand it immediately, but China is moving in this direction because of a fact that we see uh, China beginning to have uh, an influence over population, uh, new technology helping them to move, and uh, also uh, uh, even within the Communist Party, the possibility of electing at a majority uh, rulers, and then we see that the local elections for the mayors in the main cities of China begin to be democratic by the elections of a party candidate on, on a democratic way for the uh, mayors, then that's a, a, an evolution. And of course, we see that in, in, in Africa and in, in Middle East, uh, uh, the question is still uh, strongly at stake. What are the key recipes and the reason for democracy, not to begin, uh, but also to, to, uh, to survive? I would say that the first condition for democracy to begin is for the nation, for people, not to be afraid by the leaders. Uh, if you see what happened in all the countries I mentioned, the triggering mechanism of movement in favor of democracy was we, the people, are not afraid of being killed by the leaders. Either because the leaders decide not to kill anymore, or because the people were not anymore afraid of being killed. And that's what happened uh, in Eastern Europe. I personally believe that if uh, Gorbachev was not in charge and if it was someone else, and another faction of the Communist Party, which would have decided to shoot 
at the riots in Poland and elsewhere, we may still have the uh, Soviet Union alive, agonizing but alive. And the decision in 1988, in September 1988, of Gorbachev not to shoot anymore to the, to the population and to the demonstration was opening the way for a very quick end of dictators. And it was true everywhere. When nations, people realize when they can move in the streets, they move. We have seen that in China at the same moment, the government decided to shoot. And then it's very difficult to understand when a population is both understanding that the uh, country will not shoot or decided to move even if they are uh, massacred. We have seen that in Egypt where they moved and overwhelmed the army which was hesitating. And we see the tragedy of Syria where the government has still decided to kill his own people and when, of course, democracy uh, is, is still impossible and we see that in other countries such as Iran and, and others. That is a key question. When does a nation is not anymore afraid by leaders? And it's uh, uh, very often when large part of the power backing the dictator is changing his mind and think his survival is linked to the beginning of democracy. It's mainly linked to the fact of the army moving in the direction of democracy. The second dimension of uh, a sustainable democracy, not only to begin a democracy, but to be a, a sustainable democracy is to put in place uh, a stable rule of law, which organize a constitutions, uh, a judiciary system, property rights, and that can be done overnight uh, by leaders, but of course this is very often done, but this is not sustainable if there is not the whole range of support by the governments, by the nations about, about democracy. And for that, there is one and only one mechanism for people to support democracy, is that people realize that they are better off in a democratic system than in a non-democratic system. After all, in a non-democratic system, people may have a lot of uh, uh, reason to feel that life is not so bad. Uh, they have security, if they don't mind to not deal with other people's business, if they don't criticize the regime, they have a certain kind of stability and, 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 uh, and comfort. And of course, democracy is much more risky, full of doubt, and they must take a lot of, of risk. And people can only accept democracy on the long run if they are not disappointed by democracy. And the risk of being disappointed by democracy is very high today, uh, not only in the uh, country where the democracy is just beginning, such as Middle East, but also in the uh, strong uh, democratic country. Let me elaborate on that before going to the next dimension of my subject. If people realize that democracy is not bringing jobs, why do we have to go to democracy? If, and it is the case today in Tunisia or Egypt, where people do not see any progress in terms of economic standard of living with democracy, then they say, really, are we better off? And then there is the danger of coming back. We, actually, we saw that in Europe in the 20s when people begin to go backwards uh, in, in Germany against democracy because democracy were not providing jobs. And they went to what we know. And it, it may happen in uh, a lot of countries. It may happen in countries in, uh, in Africa. It may happen in countries of course, in Egypt, which is quite resembling to the French Revolution, uh, or to other uh, parts of the world. But also there is a danger for democracy, the survival of democracy in our own countries. Let me elaborate two minutes about it before moving. And I'm sure that may shock some of you what I have to say, but I think it's important to realize it. Democracy is not here forever if we do not fight for it. Why? Because there is a flow in the democratic principle. The, the flow, there are two flows, two uh, problems. The first one is when I mentioned, what, when I mentioned in the previous session, is that 
we have entered into a world of globalization. There is globalization of markets. It's clear, the markets is global. But the democracy is still local. And then a lot of decisions that were taken by the leaders, the political leaders, are not anymore in their hands. They are taken by the markets. And then people would say, what is the need for having leaders if they cannot decide anything important? And then people may say, uh, well, uh, forgive about politics. Politics doesn't care. We don't matter about politics anymore. Uh, let's have our own life, individual life. Let's move wherever it's needed. Let's avoid to take care of it. Globalization of markets without globalization of democracy, without even globalization of rule of law, is a danger for democracy, but it's also a danger for the market because a market without rule of law means a market where we have a domination of non uh, of criminal activities, or at least of illegal activities. The only country, I, I said that just before, the only country where you have a market without a government is Somalia. And worldwide, we are in a process of Somalization of the world, where we see growing forces without any control by any kind of global police, any kind of judiciary system. And then it's normal that we see a growing dimension of criminal activities, illegal activities on drugs, on sex, on, on mafia of any kind, or simply illegal activities, where we see also people um, deciding to quit because why do they stay in a country where the tax are high, where we can live in a country where tax are low, and therefore we kill a process of having instruments for political decisions because there is no way to finance them. Therefore, there is, with globalization, which is a must, condition for growth, there is a danger for democracy if democracy doesn't go to the size of the market, which is the global size. That's one dimension, what on a weakness of democracy. The second weakness of democracy is that if you look at deep in the nature of democracy, na democracy is based on the idea of individual freedom, as well as the market. I am free to decide. I am free to do whatever I want to do. I do what I want to do. That's the core of the momentum of our societies. We want to be free. But let's think of what it means if we go to the end of it. It means that I am free to decide. OK, I am free to decide. Therefore, I am free to change my mind, to change my mind in terms of political leaders, in terms of uh, who I employ, uh, where I work, where I live, uh, in terms of what is my contract with my uh, family, what is my contract with my nation, what is my contract with my children, what is my contract with the next generations. I am free means that I have no contract, no contract. And then if I push individual freedom up to the end, that means that I am allowed to be disloyal. The core of, uh, of freedom means I am free to be disloyal. In a certain sense, we become, each of us, to become is disloyal to anyone except ourselves. Very often I believe that, I think that we have invented uh, psychoanalysis to give a meaning to this sentence, to be loyal to, to, to myself. What does that mean? That means that only count myself. I am the entrepreneur of my own life. I don't care of the others. I don't care of my partners. I just want to make the best of my life. And of course, if a nation is just a juxtaposition of disloyal citizens, as well as if the company is just a juxtaposition of mercenaries taking their best without a common vision, a common goal, and uh, uh, an idea of doing something together, of course, it doesn't work. It's why I say that there is a threat on democracy, because I believe that on the long run, people will not like to be in a world of global disloyalty. If they have a choice between a global loyalty on the long term, they may choose that. It's why I believe that there is a risk, I don't say that for tomorrow, but for after tomorrow. In our countries, I mean, democracy like Israel or OECD countries, to see that people will say, I prefer long-term stability to uh, local freedom now. And then they may choose to go in favor of government or ideas that give a favor to long term, which is a case of two ideas, two main ideologies, environment 
and fun religious fundamentalism. And we see the birth now in the world of two trends which are long-term oriented, who don't care about democracy. We say environment is much more important than freedom. Uh, if mankind doesn't survive, what about democracy? And we say fundamentalism, religion, religion is much more important than democracy. And we see those two trends, which may be seen as uh, both green in a certain sense, could be a trend of a caricature of threat to democracy, as in the past, don't forget that the first social democracy was not Roosevelt, was not in Europe, it was Mussolini. The second was not Roosevelt, it was Hitler. When we see that a progress in democracy begins very often by uh, his totalitarian caricature. And we may face that today. We may face, face uh, a return back to long term. And the key challenge for democracy today is to introduce long term within the institutions of democracy. How can we do that? One of the instruments for that, in my view, is to focus on fighting against poverty. If we are not able to solve the problem of poverty within the context of democracy, if we don't give to the huge amount of people in the world that are more and more poor, the, the, the idea that democracy is coherent with a way to get out of poverty, democracy will disappear. And actually, the real figures are far from what the mainstream economic statistics are in. Poverty is not declining. It's very easy to say that poverty is declining. It's enough to say uh, there are less people earn, uh, earning $1.25 1 a day which is the definition of poverty line. Okay, that was the definition of poverty line 30 years ago. And of course, if you st stick at the same definition of poverty line than uh, 30 years ago, the number is of course declining, but it's not true anymore. The poor is mo much more complex, it's a minimum of $2 a day, and of course it's different from uh, one country to uh, another, and if you take real statistics, at least on $2 a day and more than that, to make a short, long story short, poverty is growing. Not only that you have tonight one billion people that will try to sleep starving, one billion, but this number is growing. And according to the World Bank, not only 2.5 billion people are poor or very poor now, but out of the 9 billion in 2050, more than 4.5 billion, according to the World Bank, will be poor, even if we continue to grow like we grow today and with the growth of the middle class in China, in Egypt, and in some African countries. Something has to be done. There is a clear link between job creations, poverty alleviation, and uh, democracy. And it's why, in the last minutes of this discussion, because I'm supposed to speak 30 minutes, but I'm happy to answer to any questions after. It's why I believe that there is a we have to focus on this question. How, what can we do, specifically in some countries, here in this region, about uh, your neighbors in Israel and our neighbors everywhere in the world, to raise hopes of job creations within the framework of new democracies? Everything has been tried. White elephants created by states, public jobs created by governments, foreign direct investment, nothing worked. Nothing works. It is not enough. You're far from being enough to do that. The only thing that seems to work is uh, helping poor to create their own jobs. Actually, it's very Jewish because if you look at the definition of uh, uh, a Jewish way of fighting uh, of tzedakah, you see that according to what has been said by Maimonid, there are eight, eight levels of tzedakah. The, the worst of it will be to, is to give ostentatiously uh, visibly, when you give to people and you, you have seen and put your name on it, uh, that's the worst, and the most used, but the worst of it. And I pass the different one. The seventh highest is when you uh, trust enough the poor to lend him enough money to him to create his own jobs, according to my money, 12th century, uh, 13th century. Not 12th century and 13 at the end of his life. Uh, and the eighth, eighth level of tzedakah 
is to uh, associate, to take the poor as a partner in your own business. Which is to consider that mankind is one and we are partners because I have an interest in the fact that poor are not poor anymore. Not only because it will be good for their democracy, because if they are not poor anymore, first, they can buy my products. Poor are a market. And second, they will not think about coming to take my jobs or my uh, positions because they, are, they have a capacity to develop. It's why focusing on fighting against poverty is not a generous activity. It's rational altruism or even rational selfishness. And the best way to do it, I've looked a lot, and it's why you said in your introduction that I focus on that, the best way we have found to do it is microfinance. Why? Because poor people can create jobs. Actually, as there is no um, job unemployment allowances in, in the largest part of the world, there is no one which is unemployed in the poor country. They, are, they, have, they cannot afford to be unemployed. They work. But they cannot work if they cannot afford to find finance, to finance an income generating activities. They cannot find finance for seeds, for tools, for whatever kind of instruments. And they, even themselves, the poor, have developed specific instruments for that, which is that they gather together and they make a loan between themselves without the help of the others, using their own savings, in a very sophisticated ways, actually, by providing loans to each other and this is what is about microfinance. Loans, small loans, to income generating activities to help people to get out of poverty by increasing their revenues. This is a very interesting uh, trend. It began 30, 25 years ago, uh, simultaneously in Africa, Latin America, and, and Bangladesh, with very small organizations just trying to do that. To make a long story short, today there are 10,000 institutions doing that, helping uh, 200 million uh, micro-entrepreneurs to develop with clear statistics. When someone is entering into that uh, market, uh, he gets out of poverty minimum at the next generation because he can send his children to school and to university. He can uh, have a health and then infant mortality is declining, and poverty is declining by all stat standards. We have checked that in the organization I chair, which is Planet Finance, one of the largest in the world, working also in Israel, in Egypt, and in other countries to help and foster the development of microfinance. We have a lot of impact, so social impact studies that demonstrate that it works. What is fascinating is the amount of money which is involved. The total amount of money of loans to microfinance around the world is $80 million. 1,000 of the total amount of finance of the rest of the so-called normal financial sector. One, uh, and worse than that, or better than that, three quarters of that money is the money of the poor helping themselves. Only one quarter is coming from the so-called rich countries, and half of his rich is coming from government, half of it is coming from the private sector. Today, we could help 600 million people, entrepreneurs, and 600 million, which means triple of what we have, would mean uh, multiplied by four or five for the family, more than two billion people. That's quite a challenge. It's just a matter of time, a matter of money, a matter of resources, a matter of expertise, uh, we do our best to do it, uh, we do it around the world, and this is clearly a key question for Middle East. Actually, when I launched the EBRD in Eastern Europe, the first program I launched in Poland was a microfinance program to help the development of SME, small business. And it works very well because it stabilized the economy by creating jobs, and then people realized that things were, were in a good situation. Today. Egypt, Tunisia are looked by the rest of the world. If we don't do huge effort to support that, those kind of programs in those two countries, forget about democracy in the Middle East. People will say, uh, well, they are not creating jobs, unemployment is growing, GDP is declining, and it's not a lot of money. It's just a matter of helping people 
on the ground to do it. They exist. They are a microfinance program in Egypt, run by Egyptians, outstanding people. There were no microfinance program in Tunisia up to last year, but now we, we can begin and we are going to, to begin to enter this country. And I urge you to consider that if you have any kind of uh, interest in uh, stability of the world or if you look at what kind of uh, sponsorship you can do, just look at these countries and what you can do for employment. As you maybe remember, uh, it is said in one of the book uh, and next to the Bible, uh, a very interesting speech made by uh, Solomon at the inauguration of a temple. He said uh, in this city uh, 3,000 years ago, we are a very wealthy country. We are a powerful country. We are amazingly rich. We could avoid to take care of our neighbors, but don't forget, if we avoid to take care of our neighbors, we are dead because they will envy us and come to us and take what we have. We, says Solomon, we cannot be happy if the 70 nations around us are not happy before us. Don't forget that. I was supposed to speak 30 minutes according to the, to the organizers, but if you need or if you're happy to have five or 10 minutes more of questions on any subject, this one or another one, I'm much more than happy to answer. If not, let's have lunch. Yes. Hello, um, my name is Duvit Shlomi, um, and I would like to ask you a question on democracy uh, just in the countries where it is well established. Personally, I came from Holland, and a question that um, um, makes me think a lot is what is the value of citizenship not only in the sense of rights but in the sense of um, duties and more than that of responsibility for society. I would like to hear in, in, in my experience in Holland there is for instance nothing on the issue in high school. I um, would like to hear from you what your experience uh, is and if you see any uh, chances for uh, um, strengthening democracy through um, anything that is connected with um, um, enhancing the notion of citizenship as a schut, um, as, um, uh, as a duty, as, as a privilege. Thank you. Well, uh, it's exactly what I mentioned when I was talking of disloyalty. Disloyalty means a lack of duties. I have no duty, I'm just loyal to myself. And then, in order to have a reason for, uh, a reason for uh, finding a way to push people to accept duties and not only rights, we, we talk about Bill of Rights, not Bill of Rights and Duties, uh, droit de l'homme and not droit de voir, and you're perfectly right. The only way for people to have, accept to have duties is to have an appropriation of uh, the community to consider that they are part of a community and they have a, a reason to think that this community um, is a need, is a must for them and for their children. If people believe that, if people like you in this room say to their children, if you are not happy in a given country, just get away, get a, go out, go elsewhere, then that's the end of democracy. Democracy means that we have a, an attachment to a, a place for more than one generation. And that place can be the earth as a whole. And we take care of it. And then I think that there is no way to have the acceptance of democratic duties if there is no vision of a nation, or at least of a global project of a Europe as a continent, Netherlands as, an, as a nation, mankind as mankind. Duties is linked to the understanding of long-term goals. If we are in a world of pure entertainment, pure selfishness, pure narcissism of social networks, forget about duties. And the only way to re-establish duties is to get a vision and a project. And it's why I'm afraid of the answer being, uh, if democracy cannot provide reason for duties, let's take another form of government to do it. That's the danger. 
Therefore, of course, you can go to schools and ask schools to do it, but if schools are providing duties only for the sake of duties without putting that within the framework of we want to have a country or an environment being good in the next one century, that will not work. Then, understanding of chain of generations is the key for acceptance of duties. Yes? Um. I would like to continue with what you uh, ended, you know, speaking about King Solomon and the neighbors. So we are here, we're speaking about tomorrow, we're speaking about Israel's tomorrow, well, it would be great to hear. And of course, what do we do with our immediate neighbors? Um, it's the, the, what you're, the concept, it seems to be so easy on the one hand, and yet so difficult, um, you know, because we don't know how can we as Israelis or people who have come to live in Israel from different countries, is there a way that we can contribute and help our immediate neighbors to end? And, and adding to the question, how to also confront all the different uh, challenges that you know, our neighbors are facing, such as uh, you know, fundamentalism and lack of proper education and, uh, and just living for generations in distress and no you know, well, I cannot enter into a global political program, but the, the only thing I can say is that as far as poverty alleviation is concerned, which is key for your neighbors, uh, Pierre, who is here, which is one of the most important prominent leader of planet finance in Israel, uh, may say more about it than me, but uh, we, uh, we think that it is possible from Israel to play a role in poverty alleviation and employment creation, job creation in the region. We at Planet Finance, we, we are working with the Arabs in Israel. We are working with Palestinians. We have an office in Ramallah. We are working in Cairo and in Egypt. And Israeli support is much welcome to enhance and develop these kind of activities. Um, uh, can, I, can I ask a question? Um, you spoke about um, Maimonides. Um, and I want to say that the Jewish way of giving um, loans is free of interest. And I believe that microfinance is with interest. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I happen to be the chairman of the Israel Free Loan Association, which is uh, the largest Gamach, Gimilut uh, Chasidim, interest free loan association in Israel, possibly in the world. And. Um, do you think the, uh, the Jewish way, free of interest, makes any radical difference between microfinance with interest, or from your point of view, it's the same? Well, as I don't like to be the last one to quit a room when I am speaking, I think this will be the last question, and this will be the last, the real last one of the, and then you will be the last. Uh, I wrote a whole book on that, on economic history of the Jewish people, and as you know, uh, in the Bible and in the text and in the doctrine, there is no such thing as zero interest by Jews. On the contrary, it is said that Jews between Jews may make zero interest loans, but they should, even between Jews and outside of Jewish people, have an interest. And this is a very sophisticated analysis where the interest is, in, is understood as a way for people to understand the value of time, the value of project. And interest is quite um, appreciated by the uh, doctrine. And Maimonides, among others, wrote an amazing sentence about it. Zero interest is non Jewish. But even the, con the difference between Jews and Catholic, and that reason why, as you know, they were put in the bad situation of being bound to be bankers because they were the only one uh, able to raise, um, to lend money with interest. Because if you lend money without interest, then how you make your living? And then an organization, a, a microfinance institution, which may have the idea to work without interest rates, how does it work? Where does the money come from? Either it comes from donors and the donors can disappear, or it comes from government and that's worst because they are politically oriented organization, they exist in some countries. Therefore, interest should be low, and in microfinance, interests are low compared to the loan sharks and the others, but 
interest should exist in order for the organization, we do not think about profit, but just to be sustainable to function. Zero interest rates, it uh, it's, uh, doesn't exist. Someone is paying for it. It's either the, the uh, uh, borrower or someone else. And the borrower, it's important that the borrower pay because in microfinance, the interest is not only to pay the value of time, but it's also to pay the value of advice. Because in microfinance, when you make a loan to someone, it's only income generating activities, not like subprime, which is worse than microfinance. It's money for poor, but for non-income generating activities. But it's followed by advice, and the, the uh, microfinance uh, banker is giving advice every month to the one is lending money, which is part of the price of, a, of a interest. As it is, I'm going to apologize for the next question in advance. Um, I've been reading a lot of economic studies over the past two or three years suggesting that microfinance does not actually work in order to pull people out of poverty. And you've had very respected economists doing different randomized control tiles talking about how people use microfinance more for consumption and investment, that the lives of poor are so tenuous that um, businesses can easily go wrong and then they end up in a debt trap and on and on and on and on. There's a lot of criticism. Now, I assume you don't agree with the criticism because otherwise you would not be doing what you do, but how do you answer the critics beyond... No, I, I do agree with the critics. I do agree and we fight against it. I mean, all human activities have uh, mistakes and uh, microfinance have mistakes also and I fight against it. What happened is that in some countries, mainly namely India, Morocco and South Africa, that's the three main countries, people put a name of microfinance on something which is not microfinance which is uh, consumption loans. And of course, there are loan sharks using the ethical image of microfinance to do something else. And of course, you can accuse microfinance of something which has nothing to do. And myself, I, I am going around the world to say to governments, please put in place regulations in order to avoid that loan sharks are using the name of microfinance when microfinance is not at stake. Microfinance is about income generating activities and to avoid that people are borrowing from one microfinance institution to another, hiding the fact we need to put in place uh, central bureau, uh, credit bureaus, which are institutions to control that. That, that is coming now. And uh, I think it's working. But all studies, when it deal with real microfinance, which is income generating activity loans, demonstrate that the social impact is, is sure. No problem. Thank you very much.